coming up next on Eco Company. Girl Scouts on a mission to clean up their beach, and they just never know what they're going to find along the way. We found a lot of interesting things. We found um, a boat chair that someone had just like left on the um, ground, and also we had someone bring in a shopping cart. And this Plus, forget learning about nature and books. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. These high schoolers are headed outdoors. I'm really interested in water pollution, so I felt if I can come out here and teach the kids about it, it would be a great experience. The program that's turning teens into teachers. And you thought you were busy. Check out these teens who are recycling, gardening, and more. And that's on top of their homework. Then it's into the lab. One teen's quest to create a better fuel for the planet. Goggles required. Eco Company starts now. Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Jessica. And I'm Adam. Whether it's at the shoreline, riverbank, school campus, or science lab, this week's show is all about teens going all out to make the world a greener place. First up, meet a Girl Scout troop taking action to clean up their beach. <laughs> Surf, sun, and sand. It's a picture-perfect day at the beach, if not for all this. It's trash, and it's not a pretty sight. On popular beaches like this one, it can all add up fast. More people means more of it. That's where these green teens come in. We've adopted the beach. We just really care about keeping it clean. They're Girl Scouts from Pacifica, California on a mission to clean things up around here. My friends and I, we, um, we all love going to the beach and you know every time we came here we saw that the trash keeps increasing so I just figured this would be a good thing for us all to get into. From picking up trash themselves to helping out a big beach cleanup event and sorting through the mess others left behind. They're determined to keep garbage off the shoreline and out of the ocean. Chelsea Glenn rallied her troop to take action, but they didn't need convincing. We have this nice beach here, and a lot of people pollute it, and we like, we come here a lot. We like to see it clean. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Today, they're making sure others have the tools they need for cleanup duty. Then, beachcombers scour the area, not in search of seashells, but in search of garbage. 80% of the trash that ends up in our waterways starts out here on land. The most common items found on this beach are cigarette butts, food containers, and these guys. Plastic bags. One of our biggest issues with the beach, we find a lot of cigarettes. And so we've actually recently, we wrote a letter and we've gotten more cigarette urns. Um, we find beer bottles, plastic bottles. Cigarettes are actually the number one polluter in the ocean. Then there's all the plastic that ends up out there. People will leave like water bottles if they're like hiking or something like that and they'll just toss them on the beach and it's, it's just really bad. I mean it's so hard to see because you know that it's going to go into the ocean and then the fish are going to eat it which is harmful. But it's also good because like as you can see today there's so many people here cleaning so it's really good to see. Once the trash gets picked up, it comes time to sort and they never know what they'll find out here. What are some of the things that you found today? Well, we found a lot of interesting things. We found um, a boat chair um, that someone had just like left on the um, ground. And also, we had someone bring in a uh, shopping cart. This cart was out there? Yep. This cart was out it's there. All the way the beach. Beach. This, chair. this is probably my top, just overall best delivery here. Yeah. All that. <laughs> the surprises don't end there. This guy threw it out of his house, like right onto the beach. Like today? Just threw yeah. it out? Just like right now. All right. Anna Garcia is a member of the Pacific Beach Coalition, a group dedicated to picking up this stuff year after year. It is so fantastic. This Girl Scout troop adopted this beach um, about a year ago, and it's made a huge difference. Um, really just kind of understanding the power of one. We've had students and parents and Girl Scouts come out and say, I am never throwing anything out. These teens hope the rest of us get the message too. 
I mean, it's such a big issue these days, and you know, you see it all over the television that you know you should go green, you should you know buy hybrid cars and things like that. That I think it's just so part of you know our world today that obviously it's going to make you know a lot of teens really dedicated about this kind of stuff. Being right in our wilderness in our backyard, you know, you see the effects really immediately. What are some of the messages that you have for other teens about going green and being eco-friendly? Don't waste electricity. It's, it's an easy <laughs> thing to do, to, you know, turn off water while you're brushing your teeth. That, you know, that saves gallons of water. Uh, go through your recycling. It's, it's a lot of easy stuff. A lot of people think that it's, you know, something difficult to do, to go, oh, I'm going green now, or stuff like that. It's really fun, it's interesting, and, you know, you're helping save the planet. Don't let her find a trash can, and if you put your mind to it, you can get a big group like this to come. They say it's about protecting the future of our beaches and the ocean for all to enjoy. The beach is great for everyone to come to, so it's a privilege, so we should keep it clean. Marine pollution doesn't just start in the ocean. Rivers play a role, too. So that's why keeping them clean is important, and that's where these next guys come in. They're teens teaching kids about the importance of streams. It's a go, even though we had the rain today. They're 10th graders at Pioneer High School in San Jose, California. But today, they're not just students. You guys have fun, you know, be great with them, but you know, make sure you're staying on track, keep track of your time, enjoy yourself, and hopefully have a good exercise out there. Equipped with backpacks and tall rubber boots, these guys are headed outdoors to become teachers themselves. They're trekking out to the river behind their school to meet up with some special pupils. This is Gabby. Is Hi, Gabby. You? It's all part of a special year-round program here called Biosite. It actually stands for Students Investigating Their Environment. So what we're doing is we're taking all of the fourth graders from the local elementary schools and we're teaching them about different, like the riparian community. Last time it was watersheds. There's different activities we do to kind of build up their knowledge. One activity is designed to show kids how trees can create water. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. We're teaching them a lot about trees and about the importance of what they do. And so one of the activities that we did is um, treeific trees, which is we take a bag and we put it over um, like a little group of leaves. Okay, so now I want you guys to bunch the end of the bag and put the twist tie on it. It helps the students see exactly how it works because they'll see the little condensation on the outside of the bag. Student teachers Serena and Jesse are out here because they love the environment and want to protect it. And I'm really interested in water pollution, so I felt if I can come out here and teach the kids about it, it would be a, a great experience. All right, do you see that bird right there? Mm -hmm. I kind of cool. What kind of bird do you think it is? So we had all the kids put on pretty big like rain boots, and we went up to the deepest part, and we would stick a meter stick in there to kind of measure the height. And all up along the stream, there's different heights of the river, so we kind of want to compare them. We also took this little densiometer, I think it's called, and we would count the amount, the amount of dots they had to find out how much shade we had under the tree. They collect all the data and compare the changes in the river community over time. Coming out here, by teaching the kids, we're making them aware of what's happening, all the pollutants that are in the water from the runoff, like our first huge storm last week, that all the, the metals from the cars and stuff all ran off into this river. And we just teach them about it and how you shouldn't put like soap and stuff and clean stuff off and not to litter and all about stuff like that. They're incredible. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me the, the capability, uh, the creativity, and the passion with which our high school facilitators work with their fourth graders. Birit Adam is the Biosite Program Director, which is run by the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. We are holding them to a high standard to develop their lesson plans and work with their fourth graders to the, you know, the best of their ability. And they don't let us down. And it's just exciting to watch them do their job. The day can't end without doing a little digging in the dirt or make that potting soil. Who else needs a pot? These will be later planted down by the river. It helps the students see um, that restoring the restoration of native plants is really important and having that in the community is um, a key concept of the balance that it keeps in the riparian community. It's a lesson for both student and teacher. I love it. It's such a blast. We play different games with the kids. We get them involved. Um, I wouldn't change it for the world. And we're hoping that all of Biosite students become environmental stewards for the future and 
start caring about issues like pollution, about uh, like water quality, about what's happening with the vegetation. Um, yeah, it's hopefully these are lifelong lessons that they're taking with them after Biosite. Biosite on three. One, two, two three. three. Biosite! So, saved any endangered animals lately? These guys have. And there they are. Wow. They're helping protect this bird, but that's not all these guys have been doing lately. Plus, it's the biggest composter we've ever seen. We're checking out one school that means business when it comes to food scraps. More Eco Company is next. Recycling? Check. Gardening? Check. Protecting an endangered bird? Check. If we were giving out grades, these teens would get an A plus for everything they're doing to go green. Meet members of the green team at Branham High School in San Jose, California. These guys are a part of SPARE, a group dedicated to greening up their campus. SPARE, it's an uh, acronym for Students Promoting Awareness of Recycling in the Environment. Recycling isn't all they do. They also help clubs build gardens. Plus, they've planted a native grove where everyone can come to chill out. Oh yes, all the kids like it. I mean, it's a really nice place to sit out during lunch or at break and just, you know, breathe some nice fresh air. <laughs> I think it's really great that we're so involved with the environment because it's really important. Global warming is eminent and important issue. Spare members keep on top of all the projects that make their campus more eco-friendly. We actually have 60 to 70 members and every single month we have what we call beautification where we work on the Dent Grove and also all the adopted gardens. Club members Liana Wynn and Kyle Shimabakoro are two of the ringleaders. So these are our recycling containers. Um, kids at lunchtime and throughout the day at school, they put um, beverages, bed containers, you know, cans. And then we go around after school and we take all of this recycling and we put it in these big blue toters, which are collected, I think, monthly. Spare is in charge of the paper recycling as well. There are boxes around classrooms where um, teachers and students recycle paper. And then our club comes around and picks up the paper and recycles it in the back of the school. Plastic, aluminum cans, and all that paper get hauled back here. The company we recycle with gives us 20% of the profits, and so we use the proceeds of the recycling to fund all uh, projects on campus. As you can see, they're putting that money to good use. The Grove originally was a wasteland before we got there. A few years ago, about two or three years ago, we began um, building mounds around and we started planting native species onto each of these mounds. Now this spot is home to drought resistant plants native to the area. That means they only need a little water now and then. Our environment, you know, is depleting. We don't have enough native species, which means that we don't have enough um, native habitats for our pollinators to, you know, come around and pollinate and do their thing. And so it's really important, not only just for the environmental reasons, but also for the economic reasons that go behind it. I'm humbled to say the least that they would put as much time into this as they do. History teacher and spare moderator Matt Zayner oversees the club. And we just wanted to prove essentially that a little bit of activism can create a sense of community awareness in a place where everybody could hang out and that was our goal and I guess we've proven that. Even the benches are made out of recycled materials. And see those birdhouses? You'll never guess what's in there. And there they are! They've created a nesting area for the endangered western bluebird. We have five birds in there right now. We have five eggs that just hatched, and so it's totally cool that our school, out of all the schools, has endangered species on their campus. Like, how many schools get to say that? The school tracks the birds for the Audubon Society. You can learn so much about the environment in just so little time, and joining this club has you know, made me a lot more 
aware of our environment. So whether it's picking up a shovel, digging in the dirt, or reaching into the recycling bin, these guys say the future of the planet is up to us. We're such a society that's so involved in materialism and, you know, consuming that, you know, we sometimes forget, you know, the environment that we live in. You know, we only have one, so it's very important that we take care of it. I think young people should do more because it'll be a problem if nobody does anything and, you know, we're the stewards of this planet, so it's our responsibility to take care of it. Get your goggles handy. We're headed into the science lab next. Ultimately, when it does and I let it settle, it's going to look like this. Meet one team who's got biofuels on the brain. Plus, a peek inside this. It's a compost bin bigger than we thought possible. This is called the Earth Tub, and it's basically a giant, giant composting machine. We dare you to look inside next. Solar panels. The biggest composter we've ever seen. Plus a lab being used to make biofuels. Here is another high school that's doing everything to go green. It's a sight you can't miss from the road. A giant A greeting visitors to this school campus. And it's made of solar panels. It actually uh, powers almost 60% of our, of our power use right now in the whole campus. This is the Athenian School in Danville, California. It's a place where students and teachers are doing their part to help the planet. From spending time out here, getting their hands dirty, to spending time in here, in the lab producing biofuel, they're making sustainability number one. First up, meet Maggie Rowland, a high school senior who is busy making biofuel. The plan is to use it to fuel up their green buses. So essentially what I'm doing is taking used vegetable oil that comes from the back of a fast food place and turning it into a fuel that diesel cars, or in this case, our diesel tractor and buses can use. They've built a biodiesel converter, but first things first, perfecting the formula. She's showing us the process. This is the vat of vegetable oil that I'm working from. As you can see, it's rather unpleasant looking. It's straight out of a fryer. Then it's time to mix the chemicals and add them to the veggie oil. Then presto, you've got biodiesel. So ultimately, this is gonna take a little while to mix, um, but ultimately when it does and I let it settle, it's gonna look like this, and the glycerin will be on the bottom, and the biodiesel that can go into an engine will be on the top. I can use the glycerin as soap, I can use the biodiesel, which is what I'm really after, as biodiesel. So I take a waste product that comes from the back of a fast food place and turn it into one of two things that anyone can use. Speaking of waste products, you've got to see this. It's possibly the largest composter we've ever seen. This is called the Earth Tub, and it's basically a giant, giant composting machine. It can hold up to 4,000 pounds of food waste. You see how it's really hot, it's actually steaming. Um, and we, last time we checked, it was 145 degrees. And that's because there's tons of microorganisms and bugs in there that are respirating and creating a lot of heat. And that heat actually breaks down the the nitrogen and carbon material and turns it into black gold. Senior Alon Goldbart isn't afraid to uh, get us a closer look. Then as you see it breaks down into something more black. So what do they do with all of it? They use it here in their garden. We're gonna plant cover crop. Today this crew is planting a cover crop. It helps build nutrients in the soil and get it ready for future planting. The garden's now in its fifth year of production. Uh, last year we produced over 1,500 pounds of, of food just in the summertime. Teacher John Harvey is the school's director of environmental stewardship. At its core, the school has an environmental philosophy already there. And what we're trying to do with sustainability is, is make environmentalism something that we don't just do after school or we do as an add-on. We're looking for the school itself to become a more sustainable place. Goldbart, our brave composter, is one of the regulars out here. At the bottom layer, uh, the ground cover layer, we have strawberries. And they were just in, we planted these last year. So they're just getting started producing some pretty good strawberries uh, now. After these teens finish planting the seeds, it's time to put all the irrigation lines in and test the sprinklers to make sure it's all systems go. 
Go for it. Yeah. Then, one final group project. More proof these guys don't let anything go to waste. So, from their gardening and composting efforts, to coming up with a cleaner fuel, these students are proving teens can be green citizens of the planet. Well, it's time to open up the Ecolingo Dictionary. We hear a lot about the two Bs. Biomass and biofuels. But what exactly are we talking about here? Well, biomass is organic material made from plants, grasses, and even wood, all of which contains stored energy from the sun. That stored energy can be used to create biofuels. Take corn and sugar cane. It can be fermented to produce the biofuel ethanol. Vegetable oils and leftover grease are used to make biodiesel. You can even turn landfill waste into a biofuel. Organic waste emits methane as it decomposes, and that can be used to make biogas. Biomass and biofuels. Know the eco-lingo and be a part of the solution. That's it for us. Thanks for joining us. Check out our website at eco-company.tv. We'll see you next time on Eco Company.